Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Good morning, men. Last time we began a series on work and the man in the mirror. We talked about work as an act of worship. We used the illustration of Hakim Olajuwon, who told an interviewer that when he goes out onto the hardwood, he doesn't go to work, he's going to worship. And we talked about how men sometimes, though, find themselves in a rut in their work. We talked a little bit about how men will overwork and get their RPMs going a little too fast. And the big idea last week is that work is meant to be done as an act of worship. Now, this morning, I want us to switch gears, and I want us to come and talk about doing our work as an act of fulfillment. Doing work as an act of worship is doing our work to God in a certain way. A lot of people would get caught in what I, in this, this either-or fallacy that something has to either be this or that. You either love God or you love man, but, you, you know... The, the point is, is that without a man, there's no God to love. And God wants us to love him, but he also wants to love us. And he wants us to find fulfillment in the work that we do. I had a really weird experience. I was having some tooth pain a few weeks ago, so I made an appointment and went in to see my dentist. I didn't know what was wrong, so he took something that looked like a cigarette butt and uh, put it in my mouth and, and asked me to keep biting down on it. So I'd bite down on it, and nothing would happen, and, you know, he would make a funny face, you know, kind of a... And then finally I bit down on this cigarette butt-looking thing, and this incredible uh, pain, uh, what made my whole body go into a convulsion, basically, and he, and he puts this big smile on his face, you know. <laughs> And, and you know, kind of rubs his hands together. He says, oh boy, you know, your pain is my pleasure, you know. <laughs> and so this week I, I went back in to the dentist to have uh, a crown made for this tooth because I have a, had a cracked tooth. It's not cracked anymore. It's gone. But I had this cracked tooth. And so I'm walking into the dentist's office and I'm thinking, you know, about this talk I'm going to give on Friday on Work is an act of fulfillment. And I'm thinking, you know, isn't it interesting, though, that my misery is his pleasure? Yeah. And so I'm thinking, you know, they ought to put a little sign on the door, you know, cavities are fun or something like that. Or maybe they put that up on the walls in dental school. But that also got me thinking about all different kinds of job, jobs where people find fulfillment. I mean, think about policemen. You know, somebody gets murdered or robbed or mugged or something like that, and, and, and they get the call, and, and they're filling up with a sense of pleasure, fulfillment. They're getting ready to go do what they get to do. Or ambulance drivers, or doctors, or air conditioning repairmen, or even the bug spray guy. You know, think about this. The more bugs you have, the more excitement he gets out of the whole thing. So anyway, we're going to talk about work as an act of fulfillment this morning. Michael DeBakey is now in his 90s. He works at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He was the first doctor to ever perform the bypass surgery. He's invented a number of things like the roller pump that allows the the heart to be taken offline and the surgery to be done. He's just a, a tremendous pioneer. One day, some men went into the hospital and they were walking with Dr. DeBakey. And he walked over to a maintenance man who was mopping the floor. And he said, John, tell these men what your role is here at the hospital. So John put down his mop, walked over to this group of men, and he said, Dr. DeBakey and me, we fix hearts here. 
I mop the floors to make sure that no diseases can come in because, you see, we fix hearts here. And somehow, this man has captured the essence of what I want to get across here this morning. That, and this is really the big idea, God has made our work to be done as an act of fulfillment. That we would find fulfillment in the work that we would do. That's a far cry from the passage that we're going to look at here this morning in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And if you should, you should be at that uh, chapter, but let's go to verse 17. This is the story of Solomon's experience with work. And we're going to find that Solomon had a far different experience than the maintenance man at the Baylor College of Medicine. Chapter 2, verse 17. Solomon writes, So I hated my life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work in which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all the toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. And then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This, too, is meaningless. Cup of hemlock for anyone? (laughs) Well, what's going on here? Solomon has ended up, at the end of his life, feeling very unfulfilled in his work. Why and how? And moreover, for some of us who are feeling an identity with this passage, how does that happen? And how can we, how can we get to the place where we're saying, Yeah, we fix hearts here. And that sense of fulfillment that is possible in our work. I haven't proven to you yet that God actually wants you to find fulfillment in your work, but we're going to get there too. But first, why and how on Solomon? If you were to go back and read the beginning of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and chapter 2 up to verse 17 where we started, what you would find is that Solomon has tried everything, every possible earthly avenue to find meaning, to find fulfillment. He's tried all kinds of work projects, wealth accumulation, development, real estate developments, agricultural enterprises, Merchant ship. I mean, this, this guy really has done it all. And yet here he is at the end of his life, writing in this book, how everything was meaningless. Read with me at chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. Chapter 2, verse 10. He says this, I denied myself... Nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work. And this was the reward for all my labor. Yet, 
when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Now let's take a look at God's norm, God's plan for a man. And lo and behold, Solomon is the one that gives it to us in the very next verse over in chapter 2. At chapter 2, verse 23, ended all his days, his work is pain and grief, even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. Now watch this. At verse 24, Solomon writes, A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction or fulfillment in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? And then just to airbrush this out a little bit, turn to chapter 3, verse 12. I know that there is, again, nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that every man may eat and drink and find satisfaction in his toil. This is the gift of God. And then at chapter 5, verse 18, then I realize that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot in life, this is a gift of God. So there is the biblical warrant for the statement that it is God's desire that you find work to be an act of fulfillment. That's his norm. That's his plan. And yet here we have Solomon saying that that's not been my experience. My experience is that it's grievous, it's painful, and it's meaningless. And then you have a janitor mopping floors in a hospital who's filled with the exhilaration of fulfillment. We fix hearts here. We fix hearts here. So what's the difference? Back to chapter 2, verse 26, picking up where we left off at the end of chapter 2. Solomon here describes two kinds of men. Two kinds of men. One who finds work to be a waste, and another who finds great satisfaction and fulfillment. Verse 26, to the man who pleases him, that's the key, there's a man that pleases God, and then there's a man who does not please God. We'll come back to this in a moment. To the man who pleases God, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. You want a definition for fulfillment? What is fulfillment? That's, that's not bad, those three little words right there. What is fulfillment? It's wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness uh, to the man who pleases him. But to the sinner, to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand over to the one who pleases God. Could Solomon be talking about himself there? Interesting. So, this too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It is interesting, Solomon is a Christian. You know this, right? Solomon is in heaven. You know this, right? If he's not in heaven, you're not going to be there. You know this, right? Yeah, if he didn't make it, you're not going to make it, okay? Solomon is a Christian. He believes in the Christ of prophecy. Christ hasn't come yet, but he certainly believes in the Messiah. He's a Christian. And yet we see his life 
after having every possible advantage, we find that he ends up feeling like everything is meaningless. There's a, a futility, a pervasive sense of futility to the work that he's done. And the reason, men, is very simple. He didn't live his life to please God. That's it. You want something profound? That's it. Solomon did not lead his life in a way that was pleasing to God. Now, how do you lead a life that's pleasing to God? You come to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, and there you humble yourself in faith. Because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to what? Please God. The issue is pleasing God. How do you please God? You please God by faith. By, em by embracing Jesus. By coming humbly to the foot of the cross. And I would suggest that one, one ought to renew himself daily in the gospel of Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. <clears throat> it's to repent of your sins. It's to acknowledge that Yesterday, yes, I got up and I believed God, but then I went out into the world where all day long I was tempted to exchange the truth of God for a lie, and in these ways I did, and I repent of that. I'm sorry. I became Solomon yesterday in these ways. I pursued this earthly avenue of finding significance yesterday, finding fulfillment, and it's hollow, it's wooden, it's vacant, and if I don't give it up right now, I'm going to end up like Solomon. And Lord Jesus, I put my faith in You. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my King. You are my all in all. And I bring myself under the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ who loved me and gave His life as a ransom for my sins. Nothing to the cross I bring. To Christ I cling. That's what it means to please God. It means to, by faith, cling to the cross of Jesus Christ and to abandon all hope that we're going to find any fulfillment apart from Jesus Christ. Now, the work we do can be very fulfilling when we do it for the glory of God. Our work can be very fulfilling when we do it as an act of worship, like we talked about last week when we receive it as a gift from God, as we receive it as our lot in life. That's how we please God. Now let's take a look at a few applications, a few questions that might come up as a result of this uh, passage this morning. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about Expectations. Were you surprised by the opposition you have received? Was that a surprise to you? No, I don't think so. And yet, <clears throat> there is some sense in which a lot of men, they become Christians and they think that this is going to remove the opposition. That becoming a Christian changes the world. It doesn't change the world. It changes your allegiance from the world to God, but you're still in the world. And so a lot of men end up becoming Christians, having an expectation that somehow things are going to smooth out. And do they smooth out? No. Often, what happens? They often get worse. Because the world is not our home. An announcer of a Chicago Bears football game was talking about Walter Payton, sweet Walter Payton. And then during this game, he had rushed over nine miles, nine miles across the football field. And without skipping a beat, the other announcer said, yeah, and he did that with somebody knocking him down every 4.6 yards. And that's a nice picture of life, isn't it? 
And I think one of the reasons we like football is it's a little microcosm of what's going on, the give and take, the battle of life. I have a friend, Bob Record. He's the uh, president of the North American Mission Board for the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, Bob tells this story that when he was in high school, a junior, some of his friends said, why don't you go out for football? He said, well, I never played football. He said, well, that, they said, that doesn't make any difference. You can learn. And so it sounded interesting to him. They said, yeah, that's no big deal. So they talked him into trying out. He showed up for the tryouts, and the coach gave him a uniform, told him to dress out. And about halfway through the practice, the coach comes over, and he puts his arm around Bob, and he points to the all-star fullback on the other side of the line. He said, in a minute, we're going to run a play, and uh, that fullback is going to run the ball through the line, and what I want you to do is your job is to go up here to the line, and you're to stop him from making it through the line. He said, yes, sir. And so the coach kind of pats him on the shoulders, and he said, good luck, boy. <laughs> and then he walks over to the side. Bob Record lines up. They call the play. Quarterback hands the ball off to the fullback. Fullback hits the hole, and, and Bob said, I heard two things, two things hit. Number one, he hit me, and number two, I hit the ground. <laughs> And it knocked him unconscious. And when he came to, he couldn't see. And he said, I'm, I'm blind. I'm blind. I can't see. I can't see. About that time, the trainer arrived, and he said, shake your head. Shake your head, Wrecker. And he shook his head. He said, I can't see. I think I'm going blind. I think I'm blind. About that time, the coach came over and also said, son, shake your head. So he shook his head. He said, uh, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can see a little pinhole of light. I think my sight's starting to come back. <laughs> Coach looked in and said, Son, that's because you're looking through the ear hole on your helmet. <laughs> yes, God wants us to find fulfillment in our work and there will be many troubles. It's important to have a realistic set of expectations. Second thing is calling. On your sheets, the question sheets have been handed out today, and at the bottom <coughs> is a uh, graphic which I'd like to very briefly uh, describe to you. And I want to talk to you about the subject of calling briefly. Let me explain this graph first, and then I'll talk about calling. At the top, the top rectangle on this graph is the job description that a man might have at his organization. And on the bottom are the motivated gifts and abilities that you have as a gift from God and things you've acquired through education and so forth and training. And a man's sense of fulfillment in his work will be in proportion to the degree that these two match up. Now, you can see in the drawing on the worksheet today that they don't match up, that there is an overlap here. And in the area of the overlap, that's the area of fit. That's where... The things that the company wants done and the things that you are motivated and interested in doing match. And my experience is people do whatever they want to do, even if you're paying them. So generally, people only do things that they are motivated to do. So if you're a company and you have this particular job description and you have somebody doing it, that has that particular set of motivated interests and abilities, what's the problem? It's not a fit. And so over here, we have, for the company, we have tasks that are not being performed, which results in what? On the graph here, organizational frustration. And then we have over here, on the part of the person, we have 
abilities that are what? Unused, and that results in what? Personal frustration. And so this is a very powerful diagnostic tool. It's also very helpful. I would say simply this, that God has a calling for you that fits your motivated interests and abilities. Now, will you find a job always that has an exact one-to-one correlation? Yeah, probably not. That would be very unusual. <clears throat> but you certainly, if you find yourself in this position, one reason you might not be finding fulfillment is simply because you, uh, you don't have a fit. So you might want to make a change. John Templeton, Sir John Templeton of the Templeton Funds, when he grew up, he went to Yale. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and he thought all of his life that he was going to be a missionary. But finally, he met all of the other people who wanted to be missionaries and realized that they had all kinds of skills and abilities and interests that he did not have. And it finally dawned on him that he really wasn't called to be a missionary, but he was pretty good with money. And so he decided to get involved in the investment field and that his calling was to finance missionary movements. And he's devoted a huge portion of his great fortune to funding missionary works all around the world because he understood this principle here that your job description needs to fit up with your motivated interests and abilities. Does this make sense? So I'm not going to say any more about this now, but you can play with this and, and, and see if this is something for you. So I've talked about expectations. I've talked about calling. I want to talk very briefly about cynicism. You're a Christian. Maybe you're a Christian. Assuming you're a Christian, my question is, are you also a cynic? Are you a pessimist? I cannot begin to tell you, as a man who works with men as a vocation, how many cynical, pessimistic Christians I come in contact with. It's amazing, really. And a large part of it, symptomatically, is this area of unfulfillment in work. Now, the root problem is what? The root problem is that they're not pleasing God. They're not living by faith. They're not humbly coming to the foot of the cross and daily renewing themselves in the gospel and repentance and faith, believing the lie. Okay, that's what's going on. But symptomatically, there's a tremendous sense of unfulfillment in their work. And so men do become pessimistic. Men do tend to become cynical. And there are different stages to this. You know, stage one, young man, fire in the belly, I want to do something with my life. Stage two, kind of like Solomon, all this work I've done, for what? So now the skepticism comes in. Stage three, it's, it's all been a joke. I'm bored. It's a waste of time. There's a sense of pessimism, a sense of cynicism, because this man has not, do, has not done his work as an act of worship. I would just urge you, if you find that you have cynicism and pessimism about life in general, and you can... You know, if you're yelling at the TV news, that's a pretty good indicator, you know. <laughs> hey, why, why is it that we expect the world to behave like the kingdom? Why be angry at the world for doing what the world is supposed to do? Rather, I think a better idea is to get, in, get involved in God's kingdom program and go try to do something to leave the world a better place. Final item that I would mention this morning is just the word Bible. I think a lot, of, a lot of times the reason that we feel unfulfilled is that we've lost our spiritual center. 
And that's the Bible. Men tend to become cultural Christians if they're not moving progressively towards becoming biblical Christians. It's very difficult to remain static. I mean, you're either moving in one direction or the other. A friend of uh, mine, one of our faculty members, Vince Dacchioli, uh, used to work for in the retail business. And uh, one day, a, a woman told him this story. She had been the executive vice president of Nordstrom department stores, which, as you may know, are they not moving to Orlando? Yeah, yeah they're coming to Orlando. They're out of the Pacific Northwest, and they have an incredible reputation as a, as a retailer. They're, so anyway, what happened was that a, a group of executives from the J.C. Penney Company went out to the headquarters of the Nordstrom department stores to meet with a group of executives from that company. And as the story goes, after they enjoyed uh, a time of fellowship over a meal, one of the executives from the J.C. Penney Company said to the Nordstrom executives, to what do you attribute your extraordinary success? You've created a model here that's being studied all over the world. Without a word, the executives looked at each other, and one of them stood up, went into the other room, where he picked up a book, brought it back into the uh, dining table, and he laid down this 100-year-old book on the table. It was the original operating manual for the J.C. Penney Company. And he said, we do everything it says to do in this book. You want success? You want to be a model to your kids, to others? You want to please God? Do what it says in the book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we look at a man like Solomon, many thoughts come to mind. One is just a sense of terror that that might happen to me. Another thought is terror to the degree it's already happened to me. Father, I pray that you would protect us from becoming cynical, pessimistic, unfulfilled men. That you would give us a right set of expectations. That you'd help us to know our calling. That you would remove the cynicism from our lives. And that you would help us to focus on what your word has to say about fulfillment. And not what the world has to say about fulfillment. And Lord, for those of us for whom the fires have gone out, I pray that uh, just that uh, I'm thinking about this talk, Lord. This talk is not, not enough. It's not motivational enough. It's not inspirational enough to, to change that in a man's heart and life. Only your word, only your Holy Spirit can do that. And so, Lord, as feeble as this message has been in that regard... I pray that your spirit would breathe life, new life, into the lives of the men who needed here this morning. Amen. Okay, hold your seats for just a moment.